appreciate you coming today. Uh, I, uh, I almost had to cancel my, my father-in-law and his family, my wife's family, is having a memorial service for him today, kind of way back in the spring. And I put in to do this, and then they scheduled this memorial service for today, and I was going to cancel it. They all told me, no, he would love for you to do this. Aww. So come and do this anyway. So shout out to the Crofton family. Maybe I can get this on uh, YouTube later so that they can watch it. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to here to, uh, to talk to you today, uh, the title obviously, Leonardo Beyond the Mona Lisa. Everybody's heard of Leonardo, he's the consummate Renaissance man, uh, artist, well known for the Mona Lisa, maybe even the Last Supper, but there's a lot more to Leonardo than uh, most people realize. Uh, he, uh, this, this is a picture of him uh, from the uh, uh, painting by Raphael in the Vatican called uh, the School of Athens. Which is interesting. He's pointing up. They use Raphael used Leonardo as a model here, uh, which is typically pointing toward the heavens, which is an Aristotelian kind of approach to the world, where everything comes from the heavens. Where Leonardo was very definitely uh, a, a, a man who. Uh, well, let's see how this works. Page. Yeah, there we go. Uh, who was down to earth? Uh, here's that painting. It's a very large painting. This is a doorway where you come into the room. Uh, it's absolutely spectacular. So there's Leonardo in the middle. And uh, like most of the things in this, the topics in this uh, presentation, <coughs> just going to scratch the surface. And this painting by itself is worthy of, of probably an hour long discussion. But that's not what we're here for. Uh, Leonardo, this story takes, almost, uh, takes place almost entirely in Italy. Uh, Leonardo was born in a little town outside of Florence called Vinci, hence the name Leonardo da Vinci of Vinci. <laughs> which is right about here on the map. Uh, so some of this is going to take place in Florence. Some of this uh, story is going to take place up in Milan, where he went to work for the uh, Duke of Milan. And, uh, and so I'm going to also show you some close-ups of this map. The first one's going to be right around here, uh, Florence and the surrounding area. Uh, then he, he's going to have moved and done some activities in what's called the Romagna. And uh, my pointers there. So the Romagna is uh, the area southeast of Bologna, down uh, through here around San Marino. I'll show you a close up of that map. Uh, later on in his life, Florence uh, was at war with Pisa. The Arno River runs uh, out of those mountains, and from Florence, it meets the Mediterranean at Pisa. It's a navigable river, and it was a primary means of trade for Florentine. So we know we think about Florence and its role in the Renaissance. We think about maybe the Medici and the money and the banking, but all that also came along uh, with trade. So when they were uh, at war with Pisa, and Pisa cut off access to the Mediterranean, uh, that, that uh, had a big influence on the Florentine economy. And of course, who comes to the rescue? Uh, Leonardo attempted to. So this is the area, a close up uh, inside. You see it's not very far. There's the scale right there. There's a mile. Uh, there's Florence, and Vinci is a little town up here in the hills. And uh, my wife and I were there in May, and uh, one of the things I wanted to do was go visit Vinci. Uh, because that's what nerds do when we go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you. You know you have found the right one for you when she's completely on board with this idea. <laughs> uh, so, when, because it, was, it wasn't a mess, but it was a challenge. I uh, don't speak much in the way of Italian. And uh, in the big tourist areas, people speak plenty of English and get by just fine. Because they know if you speak English, you also have the money. And, uh, <laughs> once you get out in the countryside, things get a little bit more challenging. So we got on the train uh, in Florence, and we took the train to a little town over here called Empoli, which probably deserves a, at least a half a day walking around it. It was a pretty little town. Then we figured out how to get on the bus to get on the bench. All right, so I'll just, uh, that was not easy. Uh, but we did it, and it was actually a really beautiful ride. And one of the things I was looking out the window, and was how to describe Italy, you just can't in one, one sentence. There's so many different ways. One of the most Italian country things I saw, looking out of this bus, the window, we were going by an olive grove, and I saw a bunch of chickens running around in the olive grove. And I thought, no. You might be in Italy and see chickens running around an olive grove. 
But, but before we left, you know, we have to eat something and get a cup of coffee. I'm a coffee fuel fueled person. The food, of course, you hear about it. You can't describe how wonderful that is either. So you know, if I was to ask the most important meal of the day, which I ask my students all the time. You know, talk about overnight fasting and all kinds of nutrition stuff. What's the most important meal of the day? And everything all say breakfast. But as I pro propose that question to you at 1114, <laughs> of, uh, this stuff up there, I asked one class that, and the, uh, the student said, the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't argue with Good that. <laughs> and so we're on the bus, and you can be excited. And you can probably imagine how excited I was to see the sign. We're getting closer to Vinci. And uh, this is, I didn't take this picture, this book is, uh, that picture is off the cover of this book here I got uh, while I was at the museum there. But Vinci's just this beautiful little town set in the, in the Tuscan countryside. Uh, probably, I think I read they have like 1,500 residents, so it's not very small. Uh, nearby, this is the church that Leonardo attended when he was a child, and that uh, was kind of cool to walk in there. And this is the actual baptismal uh, where he was baptized. As, uh, as an infant. And then what we did is uh, we took a hike up to uh, his, his uh, birth house, place where he was born, his, his house. Uh, and you could drive up there, but we didn't have a car. And they said, it was a pretty little walk. And so here's the trailhead, and it was about a mile. And uh, this is part of the, part of the, what's this? Uh, learn anything new in the middle of this. But the fun is there. Isn't being a faculty member just meeting challenges in front of them? And so we walked uh, through these woods, and as we were walking through these you woods, the of course, we too. pictured in our minds yeah, some fair maidens and look. knights on horseback. And then I realized, you know, Leonardo probably walked through these very same woods. And we're still talking about him 504 years after he, after he passed away. Let's see what happens when I press this button. I think I have to Click, or you got to turn it off. I, have, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have the button to be like, oh, no, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. So this is a little house that he was born in. Yeah, that's good. No, there's not another. Yeah. yeah, you won't look uh, just the top one. Just the top yeah. one. have to plug it in your own. Hi, family. This is what we go through all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, just him. <laughs> this is the house. This is the house where he was born. It's a, it was a beautiful, wonderful walk up there. It's a little warm. Um, and then, uh, let's see if this works. It didn't, uh, didn't have no, sound he used a laptop. But, uh, oh, this is a yeah. So I have Very to plug in his laptop. Oh, oh, He's already had one plugged in, so there's no USB. Oh, that extra, okay. Can you add the presentation mode? We hear there you go. Oh, no. I was here at 10 o'clock this morning and set all this stuff up. And there was another presentation that was not supposed to be. Why is this like this? 
Oh, uh, yeah. Didn't do that to me before. Up there. there. Okay. Go to presentation. Go presentation. Here? There. There. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> You can't really talk about Leonardo without the Mona Lisa. <laughs> I can only imagine what would have happened had he used another model. Uh, but I have a better, a better uh, portrait of him. And as we walk back down uh, into town, uh, this is the view we saw. I actually took this picture. Wonderful little excursion out to Vinci. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, you didn't the, bring us any. the great tour uh, uh, broadcaster, whatever, uh, Rick Steves, will tell you that when you're in Italy, there is never a reason to not stop and have gelato. Mm. And uh, so we did it at every every turn we could take, and uh, here we are having it. Are you wearing that same shark track bar? So uh, when, when Leonardo was a, a young boy, about 12 years old, he was uh, sent. His father uh, sent him to. I guess I should have told you Leonardo was born in, in uh, 1452. His father was uh, a notary, so not real wealthy, but not real poor. Uh, Leonardo got uh, was sent to Florence, where he was apprenticed to the uh, at, at, uh, very famous sculptor and painter Verrocchio, and uh, he came to the attention of. Uh, Magnifico over here, Lorenzo de Medici. Nothing happened in Florence between 1400 to 1500 without the Medici involved, the original godfathers. Uh, these sculptors are in what's called the Palazzo uh, della Signoria in, in downtown Florence. Uh, so it's, it'll take, take me back to those pictures. And while he was there, uh, as an apprentice in Verrocchio's workshop, he, he painted this, which was one of his first major works, The Annunciation, where the archangel Gabriel comes and tells Mary, hey, guess what's about to happen? Uh, this is one of my, my, my favorite paintings. Uh, I actually have this hanging in my living room, although this picture was, is in the Uffizi Gallery uh, that I took there, just as I show off my travels. Um, I like that a lot, and we uh, had a discussion with Dr. Coates about uh, this topic, and if you go around and look at the uh, various art in churches in particular, you see Annunciation paintings all over the place. And Dr. Coates said, well, I like the one, his favorite is the one by Fra Angelica. And uh, so, of course, I had to seek that out. I also have this hanging in my den. Uh, it's in the convent of uh, San Marco, which is a monastery founded by Lorenzo de' Medici's grandfather, Cosimo. And uh, I've heard rumors about it, but you come up these stairs, you go around the corner, and bam, there it is. And it's about that same size in real life. So Leonardo would have seen this uh, when he was a young person before he made his version of the Annunciation, which probably influenced him tremendously. This is a portrait uh, that he also did while he was an apprentice with Ferrocchio of uh, Ginevra da Benci. And what, what is different about this is the three-quarter profile. Is that at the time, the portraits were always from the side, either the right side or the left side. But here she's kind of turned, and you can kind of see that he's working on the, on the eyes and the facial um, recognition of, of uh, his studies of anatomy. Is that a tree behind him? It is. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a juniper, juniper tree, which, which in mythology has, uh, uh, represents female virtue. So there's a lot of virtue in this, in this painting behind, behind Ginevra. Uh, this picture here I took in the Leonardo Museum. He was uh, constantly writing things down in his, what they call codices, and we don't have probably <coughs> half of them. He loved gadgets. Uh, this little gadget he's got here uh, really kind of resembles a, a, a crane made by Brunelleschi when he was building the dome in Florence, where you, the ox would provide the power in turn and you could shift gears and make something go up, go down. And uh, his, his notebooks are filled with contraptions, most, most of which I don't even, uh, won't even have time to talk to you about today. Uh, well, Lorenzo didn't really fit in, I mean Lorenzo, Leonardo didn't really fit in with Lorenzo de Medici's group. 
they were more highbrow kind of Latin speaking, classics reading, and he was just a country bumpkin with an accent, and he wanted to get out of Florence. So he wrote a letter to the Duke of Milan, the Ludovico Sforza, basically sending him a CV saying, if you let me come here, I can do all these things. He fancied himself as a military engineer, first and foremost. So uh, Lorenzo says, yeah, OK, you can go uh, live with Ludovico. And uh, here's uh, Leonardo showing Ludovico uh, the this is a bird, uh, idea for a tank, an amphibious uh, contraption. I got a better picture of it coming up. Uh, here's a picture of the tank that he wanted to build. He would have had this coated with metal. And people on the inside, they could move the tank, and they could shoot out uh, from the holes, and they would be protected. Now, it's really odd that Leonardo fancied himself as a, as a combat engineer because he was very much of a pacifist he would, uh, and a vegetarian. Uh, he would buy pigeons and set them free. When back in the day, most people didn't have a large component of meat in their diet. Meat was very expensive. So for him to be so focused on machines of war, uh, kind of unusual. Here's a, a guns were very new, and gunpowder was very new in, in uh, Europe at the time. So here's another contraption he made. Uh, call it a machine gun, but I guess it's just really, you have to fire, fire it once and then reload it. I like this contraption. This is probably my favorite, where uh, you have guys that would provide the, the power of you know, those windlasses, and, and then there would be a gearbox, and it would, it, this would act as paddles, as propulsion, and then also when it would act as wheels when you got on land, it looked like it would probably be a kind of a rough ride. But remember, this is 500 years ago. This is more than 500 years ago. And what it was really famous uh, in, in uh, Milan for, and one of the things that uh, a, uh, aspects of Leo, uh, Lorenzo told Ludovico, hey, this guy's a good musician. And uh, so he had fancied and made a lute, uh, a lot lyre, that's out of, uh, in the shape of a horse head, out of silver. And allegedly he could play it, uh, and it would just be magical sound. So instead of building more machines of war for Ludovico Sforza, what he really did was play music, uh, make decorations for parties, and uh, basically was uh, the, the, the court. Uh, not, not jester, but he was, uh, he was the entertainment, which really he didn't like. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ludovico commissioned Leonardo to do was to build a monument to Ludovico's grandfather, Francesco Sforza. And it was supposed to be a, a, a bronze horse with a rider, 21 feet tall. He never got to build it. This is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, Woo! That's <laughs> <laughs> right. Have you ever seen it? No. It was actually there. Oh, is, is that Breaking Mario Gardens? I think so. That's why I have to do Anyway, so he got, they got all the bronze and uh, needed for the project, and he was working on the way they make bronze uh, sculptures. He had to do all this other stuff to, to make the mold and everything. And just as he was getting ready to uh, start working on it, uh, uh, the French king, Charles, the, Charles VIII, decided he was going to come down and take over Milan. And uh, so they turned the bronze from the sculpture into bronze for cannons. And Leonardo never really got over that. That, that really, that really uh, upset him. But what it was even worse is his model that they he was using as a mold. When the French troops got there, they used it for target practice. Uh, Leonardo wasn't there at that at that moment uh, because everybody that had uh, uh, any sense about them took off. Uh, the uh, the French military. It was different. In Italy, the way the wars were fought is that there wasn't very few standing armies. The local cities that were fighting with each other would hire mercenaries under the command of a conductiere, a mercenary general. And they would basically ride around on horseback, walk around out on the field, look at each other like a chess match. And when it was, somebody was in checkmate, then they would just leave. They had no interest in killing each other. <laughs> Uh, as opposed to the French who came down with their brand new big cannons and they just were very brutal. So people fled Milan when that happened. Another thing that, that, that uh, Leonardo did accomplish while he was in uh, Milan was in the church of the Santa Maria della Grazia, he painted the Last Supper. <coughs> Leonardo's an engineer, he's a sculptor, he's a painter. Uh, I unfortunately have not seen this picture yet. Hopefully I will in January, but I took this picture, it's on my wall in my living room. Uh, 
one of the pieces of work that would have influenced Leonardo in his painting of the Last Supper is also a, a work in the, the uh, monastery of, of San Marco. Uh, this, this work here is done by an artist named Guillermo Dial, another very famous high demand uh, artist. And so this would have been a couple of years before Leonardo painted his. And he most certainly would have seen this and another Guillermo Dial Last Supper across town. Uh, and what Leonardo's version is a little bit different. You can always you see John over here asleep. Uh, you see, you can tell Judas because he doesn't have the, the halo. He's oftentimes depicted on the other side of the table uh, from the others. And it's a very good painting. When I was in San Marco, I actually forgot it was there. I came downstairs from where the Annunciation was. And it takes up a whole wall. Leonardo's version, uh, not, not only being more uh, very colorful, but uh, his hands, there's a lot more energy, there's a lot more action going on in this painting. Uh, I read a book, uh, this is one of my, uh, one of my references here, uh, Leonardo and the Last Supper. There's an entire chapter in this book on the hand positions. And uh, if you were at the Math and Science Division meeting the other day when I was talking about uh, a Golgi, I was doing a this, so with my hands, you see. I'm actually speaking Italian, but with the hand emotion, you can, you can understand what I'm saying. <laughs> and the Italians, of course, are very much known for uh, their hand positions. Uh, here in this painting, we have Judas here. He's kind of reaching for the bag of gold. And Jesus is reaching for what is he reaching for? A piece of bread, maybe. Uh, and just as one, this one here, one of the most famous uh, hands, fingers in all of uh, history, uh, Doubting Thomas. He's pointing up, he's saying, This is not me. These people are over here. But no, it's not me, it's somebody from over there. And of course, John's asleep again. Or is that Mary? I would have to refer you to Dan Brown's version. In, uh, during World War II, the Santa Maria del Grazie, the refectory where the Last Supper was, took a direct hit from an Allied bomb. Uh, in this other book here, another reference, Saving Italy, thank you, Dr. Coates. Uh, fascinating book. Uh, that's where these, these next two pictures came from. Uh, the Allies took great pains to try and preserve cultural treasures in Italy. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, what they did is they had sandbags and mattresses boarded up. Uh, in Florence, they made concrete domes over Michelangelo's uh, uh, David statue. Uh, they hid the paintings from the Nazis who uh, were very much interested in acquiring the artworks by any means possible, otherwise known as looting. And so the refectory uh, took a direct hit. And we can see how close this came. Uh, we came to not even having this work anymore. It's behind all that, that scaffolding. They, they put a tarp over it uh, to keep protected from the rain for a little while while they cleared the rubble and rebuilt the monastery. Then uh, he runs into the employ of a guy named Cesare Borgia. Now, uh, after the Milan incident, Leonardo went back to, to Florence, and uh, the Florentines sent him to work with uh, Cesare. Basically, the Cesare Borgia was the son of Rodrigo Borgia, who became Pope Alexander VI. Uh, very notorious, uh, uh, not any not notorious time. But uh, so the question, of course, is how does somebody who is a Catholic priest, bishop, cardinal, and pope have children? It was common in the day. Uh, and Cesare had, uh, had, and the pope had, had designs on that area of Italy, the Romagna, the southeast of Bologna. I'll show you the map in just a second. And uh, he wanted a military engineer, and he wanted Leonardo. And he told the Florentines, basically, send me Leonardo. He told them, I'll be your friend or I'll be your enemy. The choice is yours. And Florentine, the Florence didn't have a standing army. They were terrified of Cesare, so they sent Leonardo uh, to work in his employ. Cesare was often described as the most handsome man in all of Italy, which changed in 2019 when I went there for the very first time. <laughs> <laughs> and I told my wife. Cesare is no longer here. I am now the handsomest man in Italy. And she said, yes, honey, of course you are. <laughs> so, 
So this is the area, here's Florence again, Pisa over here, and this is the area where uh, Cesare and his armies, uh, he had French support as well, and uh, marched up from Rome into the Romagna, and his first stop was in this little town here called Urbino. And Urbino was, the time was ruled by a guy named uh, Guido Baldo de Montefeltro. I just like this. And uh, Cesare said, hey, I need some help. Can you send some troops to help me at Chassan? And uh, the, the Duke, he said, Guido Baldo said, yeah, sure, I'll send some troops over there to help you. And so while the Duke's troops were up here, Cesare snuck in and, and took over Urbino. And uh, he was known by, to, to get his, achieve his goals by any means possible. While he was in the castle in Urbino, Florence said a, uh, sent a, a delegation to talk to Cesare to find out exactly what he was up to. And that, that, that uh, one of those envoys was a guy named Niccolo Machiavelli, who was very famous for writing the book The Prince and the phrase, the means justify the ends, or the ends justify the means. And it's, it's the main influence of Machiavelli for the prince was Cesare Borgia. So that's, that's how Cesare Borgia operated, by <laughs> deceit and lies, and you could never trust him. Along the way, go back to my map. So he came out of Urbino, and he starts taking over the towns of, of the Romagna, uh, and he gets to Forli. And uh, there's a castle there in Forli, and uh, it's another entire story. And I may actually do another one of these presentations about her uh, in, in the spring. Uh, Katerina Sforza. Katerina Sforza was the, the niece of Ludovico Sforza in Milan. She was uh, the countess of, of uh, Forli and Imola. Her husband, a great age jerk. As a matter of fact, I got a treaty that I made that for him. I got to cut it down in New York. I cut it down in Burma. <laughs> Her husband was uh, Geronimo Riario. Anyway, he was a bad, bad guy. He died uh, through tech treachery, and uh, she took over. And allegedly, she stood up on the battlements when Cesare got to Fort Lee, and he said, "Surrender your castle," and had his son, her son, Ottaviano, at knife point. And she said, he said, give up your castle or I'll kill your son. And she said, go ahead, I can make more. <laughs> <laughs> and alleged, there is a rumor that she lifted up her skirts and showed, her, uh, showed him, hey, I can make more. <laughs> Machiavelli was there at the time. Machiavelli was a very good chronicler of events, and he doesn't mention the, the skirt thing. But uh, anyway, Cesare was a, uh, eventually did take her castle. And uh, this is the castle here, the Rabadino. And... Uh, he opened this, what it looks like today. He, he did take it over and he captured uh, Caterina and had her transported to Rome and thrown into the dungeons of Castel Sant'Angelo, which is a place you do not want to go, is in those dungeons. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, Leonardo pioneered was that the castle walls had sharp angles and flat walls. And at the time, the cannons that were used in Italian warfare shot basically just rocks. And the rocks would shatter against the walls, it was no big deal. But the uh, French cannonballs shot metal. Uh, the French cannons shot big, huge metal shot. It was easy to, to uh, knock the walls down. So one of the modifications that Leonardo made was to make the uh, surfaces as round as possible. And he said, I couldn't find the quote, but it was something along the lines is that the more oblique the angle of impact, the less damage it will do, which is trigonometry. Uh, another thing he did was made a map of, of uh, the little, one of the other little towns, Imola. And this is a very accurate map. Go back and people compared this map to the actual town, and it, 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 the measurements are very accurate. And then another thing that was unusual is that maps were not usually made like we see them today from, the, from above but were made from an oblique angle where you'd see the mountains in the background and some clouds or something. So this was really unique. And how did he make such accurate measurements? Because he made himself an odometer where you, the, the wheel would roll and it would make a click each time we'd go around, we'd click something up there, and then every 10 times we'd click another thing over here. And through that method, he could estimate distances, which really is actually uh, kind of a crude calculator. 500 years ago. 
It came back. Uh, it came back to uh, Florence, and they, the uh, Signoria, the ruling body of Florence, commissioned him to uh, make a painting of the Battle of Anghiari, which is uh, famous in Florentine history. Uh, they they beat whoever it is they were fighting, and uh, this is not. It never got done. Uh, this is. Uh, he made a car, what they call a cartoon, which is a sketch of what you're going to make on the wall. And Rubens saw the cartoon and made his paintings. This is by Rubens, not Leonardo. But uh, he made this after he saw the war and what Cesare was doing in the, in the Romagna, and he hated it. Uh, and so it's interesting that he would make a painting about a scene that he did not like, the warfare, before he went to go work with chess, right? Before he had ever seen actual war, uh, he came up with this, he, he wrote in his notebooks about how to, how to depict this in art. He said, if you show a man who has fallen on to the ground, you must depict where he slipped on the dust, which now has been turned into mud by the blood. You must show the tracks of the horses and the men who have passed over this blood-smeared earth. A horse will be dragging behind it the body of its dead rider. Men fleeing a rout will be shrieking through their open mouths. The ground must be littered with all kinds of weapons, broken shields, lances, stubs of shattered swords, and other things. There could also be a riderless horse plunging into the enemy, its mane flying into the wind, inflicting severe wounds with its hooves, or maybe a wounded man lying on the ground trying to protect himself with his shield, while his enemy leads over him, trying to deal a killing blow with his sword. Be sure not to leave a level spot, which is not and trampled with blood and gore. So he wrote that before he actually even saw uh, real warfare. So this uh, this painting didn't get made, unfortunately. And then there was Machiavelli. So Machiavelli was traveling around with Cesare and Leonardo during uh, Cesare's campaigns in, in the Romagna, which would have been uh, around 1502, 1503. Uh, he was reporting back to Florence about the activities of Borgia, spying on them, if you will. His uh, communiques would get intercepted. Some of them wouldn't make, uh, make it all the way back to Florence. Um, but they would have been both Florentines at around the same age. Leonardo was a couple years old, uh, uh, older than, than Machiavelli. They most certainly would have known each other. They certainly would have known each other while they were in uh, Cesare's employ. And Cesare had a high, a very high uh, opinion of Leonardo, where he wrote a, a pass, you know, he just couldn't just wander around the countryside back then. Uh, he said, to all our lieutenants, this is from Cesare, this is uh, Leonardo's passport, to our lieutenants, castellans, captains, contacchiere, officials, soldiers, and subjects who are presented with this document. Our most excellent and most dearly beloved friend, the architect and general engineer, Leonardo da Vinci, the bearer of this pass, has been commissioned to inspect the buildings and fortresses of our states, so that we may maintain them according to their needs and on his advice. Furthermore, we order and command the following. All will allow him free passage, exempt from any public tax, or charge either to himself or his companions, and will welcome him in a friendly fashion and allow him to inspect measure and examine anything he wishes. And to this effect, he will provide him with any men he requires and give him any help, assistance, and favors he asks. It is our wish for any work to be carried out within our states. Beforehand, each engineer required to consult with him and to conform to his judgment. Let no man presume to act otherwise unless he wishes to incur our wrath. And he did not want to incur the wrath, wrath of Cesare Borgia. So there's nothing about painting in that description. How well they knew each other, how friendly they were, the influence on each other. Uh, there's questions uh, about that. There is another other quote here. Uh, Leonardo talks about science, but then Machiavelli probably was arriving at his own conclusions about the same time. Where Leonardo was looking for explanations about the natural world, Leonardo, uh, Machiavelli was looking for explanations on how people act and how politics works. And so this, uh, this uh, short quote here uh, reflects a little bit about uh, both of them. 
our, all our knowledge has in its origin.